Good evening. Can you hear me? Good evening. There we go. Wonderful. My name is Bob Stein. I'm the interim dean of the College of Continuing and Professional Studies. On behalf of the college and Learning Life, welcome to this evening's Headliners event. Uh, I want to start with kudos to those of you who made it to last month's Headliners. Anybody in the crowd who made it? Yes, all right. I think about 60 people. If you remember, it was in the midst of a snowstorm. Um, and I, uh, sorry I couldn't make it. I was actually at a meeting, got invited to a dinner with the Regents. Uh, we were over in the Bell Museum, so not very far away. I was here with you in spirit, but uh, we were also in the same snowstorm. Um, so I know you enjoyed having Dean Emeritus Mary Nichols uh, reprise her role as the MC. Mary's here again today. So uh, thanks, Mary, for filling in for me. Um, when, 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 when I saw the conflict on this schedule, I immediately called her and she very willingly said, I'd be happy to do that, not knowing that she was going to have to come here in the middle of a snowstorm. So anyhow, but I, I understand you had a great question and answer session with Dr. Jenny, and so I'm glad that happened. Uh, kudos also in order to the 202 intrepid individuals who made it to last Saturday's Learning Life sampler in bad weather again, and 78 people perhaps wisely decided to attend online. <laughs> and uh, in a theme, things coming, i um, going to prematurely extend our collective best travel wishes to about 50 people who are supposed to come here this Saturday uh, for <laughs> a, uh, a uh, Learning Life event on my Antonia. Uh, it's, of course, offered as, uh, in cooperation with the Illusion Theater. And fortunately, tonight looks like we're about 36 hours away from the next big snowstorm. Uh, so I'm glad you all made it. I was thinking about this, wondering if we should recall Dr. Mark Seeley and see... <laughs> does anyone remember, did he predict an El Nino moderate winter this year? I, if he did, no, it didn't work. Uh, at almost every Headliners event, we have some post-secondary enrollment option students here who join us. I want to extend my welcome to the students who are here tonight. We're uh, very proud of the 600 or more PSEO students that are in the college's program. Uh, they're motivated, high-achieving high school students. They're taking courses here on campus and earning both high school and college credits as they do it. Many of them matriculate, about half those students matriculate here at the University of Minnesota, and so we're pleased to get them off to a good start. So welcome to our PSEO students tonight. And uh, before beginning our conversation this evening, I want to take just a moment to recognize one of the graduates of our college. Uh, his name is Stephen Brennan. He graduated, he earned a master's degree, uh, master's of professional studies in integrated behavioral health. Uh, Stephen is this year's recipient of the University Professional and Continuing Education Association, that's UPSEA, uh, their National Outstanding Student Award. So he, he won regionally in the central region of the, of the country and then won the national award. And we have a one-minute video uh, of Stephen that I'd like to share with you. I'm extremely honored to receive the UPSIA Continuing Education Student Award. I began my education at the University of Minnesota in spring of 2015. In my program, we focus on the integration of mental health and addiction services. In addition to school, I worked as a program director at a group residential facility for men with co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders. This inspired me to seek additional training working with diverse populations through a fellowship from the National Association of Addiction Counselors. This experience also opened my eyes to the strong link between PTSD and substance abuse. To help me address this link, I sought additional training and certification in PTSD therapy at the University of Minnesota, which enabled me to do individual trauma therapy and to facilitate PTSD symptom management groups. I'm thrilled to be receiving this award from UPSIA and I'm very grateful for this acknowledgement. Thank you. So uh, that's great. Uh, I'll be with Stephen in Seattle in just a few weeks when he accepts the award at the annual UPSIA meeting. Uh, it's clearly a highlight for him, but it's a highlight for us as well, demonstrates the amazing students that we have in our programs. And in case you didn't know, uh, we have about 250 graduate students all together in six degree programs and about 800 undergraduate students in six bachelor's programs as well. So uh, thrilling for us for Stephen to win that award this year. Sorry, my thumbs are not working on my pieces of paper here. Here we go. Uh, so now to this evening's event. And uh, before we begin, as always, I'll ask you to mute your cell phones. 
uh, if you're active on social media, you can follow Learning Life and face on Facebook and Twitter, and our hashtag is UMN Headliners. So the, the United States has begun an historic shift away from Pax Americana, which is defined in one place as a state of relative international peace regarded as overseen by the US. Established in the wake of World War II, Pax Americana has sought peaceful international relations and an open economy buttressed by US military power. In championing America first priorities, President Trump has shifted the political direction towards selective US engagement, where foreign commitments are limited to areas of vital US interest and economic nationalism is the order of the day. To delve into this situation and what it means for geopolitics and US foreign policy, we're pleased tonight to welcome Tom Hansen. Tom is diplomat in residence at the Allworth Institute for International Affairs at the University of Minnesota Duluth. He's a former US Foreign Service officer whose postings included, listen, East Germany, France, Norway, the former Soviet Union, Sweden, and the Republic of Georgia. He also participated in, in the opening of new US embassies in Mongolia and Estonia. He worked on the foreign relations committees of the US Senate and the House of Representatives, and he served as director for NATO and European affairs at the Atlantic Council of the United States in Washington, DC. Tom earned his bachelor's degree here from the University of Minnesota and graduate degrees from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, the Institute of Advanced International Studies in Switzerland, and the National School of Administration in France. He currently is a member of Global Minnesota's Great Decisions Advisory Committee, chair of the Minnesota Committee on Foreign Relations, and co-chair of the Minnesota China Business Council. This past November, Tom was recognized with Global Minnesota's 2018 Ambassador Award. So please help me welcome world traveler, Tom Hansen. Thanks, Bob, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Bob, very much. And uh, it's a real pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, uh, this is a... A wonderful program. I'm, I'm really amazed at the turnout. This is a, really a vibrant program here, so congratulations on that. Um, it's an honor to be here. And yes, tonight I'll be offering a few reflections on America's place in the world um, in light of the changes that are underway out in the world, in light of our own domestic politics. Um, uh, one way of, of sort of summing up the issue is, yes, Pax Americana. Uh, Pax, the Latin word for peace. And um, this is the map, if you will, of that period of history where we found ourselves at the center of, a, of an emerging geopolitical economic structure. Um, we engaged really uh, intricately with the world for the first time in our history um, uh, with World War II and, and the aftermath. And um, it's, I think this is the map that all of us probably have imprinted on with the United States in the center. Um, this thing doesn't want to go away here. There, okay, stay. Um, yes, with the United States at the center, we, we found ourselves at the center of an alliance system that spanned two oceans, anchored by the two defeated powers of World War II. Um, if you look at this map, it would seem as if there are two continents on either side of us, uh, which of course is incorrect. There's one continent there, and I'll be talking about this again in a minute. Um, but this is the structure that people refer to when they refer to Pax Americana. Yes, it, our, our military, our, our diplomacy assured a certain tranquility in the space where we had influence. Obviously, there was another part of the world, um, uh, the Soviet Union and its allies. Uh, China was walled off going through the Cultural Revolution other things. India had high tariff walls around it, too. So we're not talking about a global system. We're talking really about the West and uh, parts of Asia. I think it's very significant that up until about 1980, uh, it's estimated that 95% of world free trade took place among just 17 countries along these two littorals, uh, the, these two ocean uh, areas. So um, as I say, this is the map uh, that we uh, have imprinted on. Uh, and this I'll be describing now a lot of changes that have been underway. Um, uh, in the ensuing years. Um, let's see now. Just one second. Okay, maybe 
this will stop doing that. Email. Yes, now I can advance it. So um, I think people refer to Pax Americana because of the historical uh, reference points, the Pax Romana. Uh, it wasn't the whole history of Rome, but during the period indicated there, uh, Rome as assumed a certain peace really up through, the, um, through Hadrian and beyond. Um, and then, of course, the Pax Britannica, where the British Navy uh, assured a lot of the world sea routes. You could say, in a way, that the quote-unquote Pax Americana was something that succeeded upon the Pax Britannica. Um, our Navy, um, our role in diplomacy in the Middle East and elsewhere, really, we stepped into the shoes of the British. Um, and it was a fairly smooth transition within a cultural space, not just of the West, but of the Anglo-Saxon West. It went very, very smoothly. Um, the situation we're coming to today, however, will be quite different. Because if there's a transition underway now, and there may well be, it will be to countries like China, which have very different civilizations, very different ways of doing things from the West. And we cannot expect them to mirror us necessarily um, as this historical era unfolds. Um, so this is likely to be quite different from the last transition the world went through. There are major changes underway now uh, in the world that are impacting uh, what you might call the Pax Americana. If you look first at population, this is the most recent estimate. As you can see, the West pretty much disappears from the chart. Um, the United States still holds, beca only because of immigration, will we reach those, those numbers. If, if we cut off immigration, it'll be far fewer. India emerges as by far the most populous country. Look at Nigeria coming up. Um, it's estimated that by the end of the century, 40% of all people will be living in Africa. Now, when you add India, China, Asia to that equation, you're talking about 80 to 85% of humanity by the end of this century. So how can it be anything other than a new system that is emerging, just based on demographics? Um, 11 billion, that's a lot. Uh, the world population in 1776 was 1 billion. In 1945, 2 billion. Uh, it's amazing the, the, the growth that's been underway since 1945. Um, some estimates go as high as 12 billion for the overall population. But in addition to this, this very significant uh, demographic shift, which will make Africa increasingly important, um, the global economy has been shifting. This is a chart by Annis Magnuson, um, Madison rather, uh, he's passed away since, but was the most famous sort of um, analyst of the global economy. And as you can see, uh, for most of human history, the bulk of global economic activity has been in China and India what is now China and India. Of course, uh, that has to do with demographics as well. But the real essor of the West, which our position has sort of piggybacked upon, came around 19, uh, rather 1820, the Industrial Revolution. The, the past 200 years, roughly, have been what we have come to see as normalcy, but the Chinese call guo chi, which means eating bitterness, a temporary cycle which is coming to an end. If you talk with a Chinese scholar or even a student, they see this all in cyclical terms. And uh, they believe now that they are, they are on the upswing as the West begins to uh, not decline necessarily, but, uh, but, but there's a cyclical um, uh, cycle in, in, in place. Now, as you can see, this is as of 2008. You've got China, India, Japan, others coming, squeezing the West. It would be far more the case if we had a new chart because since 2008, 40% of all global growth has been in China, 40%. And so, of course, what we're really dealing with and talking with the Pax Americana is the emerging role of Asia and especially China and how the U.S. will adapt or counter or cooperate with this emerging phenomenon. It's exactly 40 years, January 1979, when Deng Xiaoping and Jimmy Carter signed the final um, establishment of diplomatic relations. China had just opened its economy uh, the autumn before in 1978. It's been exactly 40 years now of globalization. And we're 
living now with the results in many, many spheres. Uh, people are looking, and whether it's our domestic job situation, our trade balance, our role in the world, people are assessing the results of this 40-year period. Um, and already when Dung passed away in 97, uh, Time Magazine was asking what will his heirs do um, in turning uh, China into a superpower. And we're, we're living now in that reality. Uh, the, this is the latest uh, projection of the world's leading economies by 2030. Of course, a lot can change. Um, uh, the, all these, just with the demographic projections, this is all notional at this point. But China comes up very close to the U.S. by 2030. And if you take purchasing power parity, which is another way of measuring GDP, they have long since surpassed us. Um, and even more indicative is the R&D spending chart on the right in which China now is investing. Um, I think since this chart, they've actually surpassed us in research and development spending um, going forward. These are significant statistics. So uh, I, I guess if you remember that first map of the Pax Americana, um, as I tell my students now, this is the map we have to have in mind going forward, um, in which Eurasia is a continent. It's one that's linked down to Africa. And that landmass um, will be key to the next era, and we are extraneous to it. Uh, this is not our region. And a lot of the challenge to US foreign policy today is how to keep ourselves in the game, how to interpose ourselves on this rising region. Now, um, in addition to these trends that I just outlined, there are things happening within our own country that are affecting at least the pace of these developments. Um, it's not just President Trump, although he is quite indicative. The United States has become a, an unpredictable country. Um, we go back and forth in recent decades between quite different administrations with very different outlooks. We come close to defaulting on our debt, which we did uh, before even Trump came in. Um, many, many polls now done internationally uh, cite the United States as the greatest factor for uncertainty in the world today. Now, um, it's true that President Trump is, in essence, undoing much of what Obama did. Obama never had a majority in the, in the Senate and in, 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 the, in the Congress. So much of his, especially foreign policy, was passed by executive order. He didn't have a two-thirds majority for treaties, which means it can be undone uh, in a heartbeat by his successor. Right at the outset, Donald Trump signaled that America first would be his theme. Uh, Wilbur Ross, his Secretary of the Commerce, uh, early on said, if you want to understand this administration and President Trump, you only need to know one word, and that's bilateral. Bilateral, bilateral, bilateral. Um, President Trump has been saying pretty much the same thing for 30 years. This is a, an ad he took out in our major newspapers over 30 years ago, which basically says what he says today. The world is taking advantage of us. No one respects us. This must stop. I don't know what may be in the psychology of President Trump that leads him to extrapolate that way, but it is a very much his worldview. And so he, in his own mind, believes that he is, is undoing um, long periods of the US being taken advantage of. Um, and, uh, and of course, he is resolutely against multilateralism. He went to the UN General Assembly last fall, basically attacked multilateralism, encouraged all the present members to act bilaterally, to develop their own national identity and to cooperate on that basis rather than multilaterally, which is quite a thing to say in the UN. Um, now, early on, you know, I, about the only person still in the Oval Office there is Andrew Jackson. Um, uh, <laughs> President Trump had the portrait of Andrew Jackson brought over from the portrait gallery early on to, to signal the, the populist nature of his presidency. We, we don't exactly have livestock grazing in the White House, uh, but, you know, he's trying, to, he's trying to make a point. Of course, everyone else in that room there has been, has gone their own way, uh, whether to prison or elsewhere. Anyway, um, 
So right at the outset, Donald Trump did several things to, to set this new tone. Uh, number one, on day one, he pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which had been Obama's centerpiece for policy in Asia. This sent a signal to the world that the U.S. might be withdrawing. This was not lost on China, which clearly uh, quickly stepped in with their own trade proposals in Asia. We pulled out of the Paris Climate Agreement, which uh, led to major uh, tensions with our European allies. Uh, there are many photos of Angela Merkel that, are, that, that speak volumes. <laughs> Um, it, it wasn't just the Paris Climate Agreement. I mean, the president's statements on NATO, the idea that we will defend you only if you pay your 2%, that sort of thing, um, got our European allies uh, to pay attention. Um, the President Trump would say that this is part of the art of the deal. You stir things up. You're outlandish. And then once you've created, softened everything up, you strike a deal. Well, you know, it, Remains to be seen whether this will be uh, the paradigm that emerges. I, um, I recall being in a meeting at the State Department uh, uh, with Rex Tillerson when he was Secretary of State, and it was pretty clear that the idea was there are adults in the room, that there are some old kind of solid advisors around Trump, Jim Mattis being one, um, H.R. McMaster at the time, that when, 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 the, when they agreed on something, they could really have an impact on President Trump. And of course, all those people are gone. Uh, in the second year now, from the second year on, uh, you've had uh, Mike Pompeo at, uh, at State, um, who along with uh, Vice President Pence is on record as believing in the rapture, and um, no kidding, and um, who is a much more hard-fisted, shall we say, uh, foreign policy advocate, as is John Bolton, who um, is having a major impact. So, uh, once again, there's been unpredictability within the administration as these advisors have shifted. And the key advisor all along is Jared Kushner, who basically, uh, especially on Middle East policy, is calling the shots. So this uncertainty factor, is the U.S. pulling back? Um, you know, are we about to abandon uh, the Pax, Pax Americana? Um, here's a kind of a cartoon that came out recently about that. Uh, so... Uh, Donald Kagan, uh, sorry, Robert Kagan, was a very prominent neoconservative advisor. He, he very important to both the Democrats and the Republicans. He would have, he was an advisor to Hillary and an advisor to two previous Republican candidates for president. And he posed the question recently: um, Is this an aberration or a culmination? Is what we're seeing in the this administration? a one-off deal that can be undone that may be over even before two years? Or is this merely a reflection of deeper tectonics, deeper trends within U.S. society? Um, he is convinced it's the latter, that, that, that Donald Trump is no fluke and that there are very specific economic uh, and other issues that, that he was able to exploit in being elected president. Kagan is somebody who wants the U.S. to get back to its role as, as, uh, as, as enforcing a Pax Americana, um, and he's playing Cassandra to some extent in, in, in being this dyspeptic, I think. Now, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get a little bit historical here, because in addition to what we've been experiencing in the last couple of decades, there are deep traditions in, in our country which are still there, and I think which you have to understand as, as a sort of a prism for understanding uh, our policies. That's not John Bolton, by the way. Um, <laughs> uh, why am I showing you a picture of Otto von Bismarck? Well, um, Bismarck has many quotable quotes, and one of them was uh, when he referred to the United States as the luckiest country on the planet. He said it's, just, it's, it's surrounded to the north and south by weak and friendly neighbors, and to the east and west by fish. And um, as he said, no other country enjoys that kind of a blessed uh, ge geographic situation. And ge geography is to an extent destiny. And throughout our early history, um, our early presidents, um, based partly on this geography, had a very clear point of view, which is still latent all through our society. This is the first photo we have of a president. 
Um, this is John Quincy Adams. It was taken after his presidency. But he um, is famous for a quote that one hears all the time in Washington these days, at conferences. Um, and he was expressing the view of really all of our early presidents who warned against entangling alliances, warned against, as Washington put it, the insidious wiles of the outside world, warned against the corrupt Europe of empires and, um, and wars. And so John Quincy Adams famously said, America does not go abroad in search of monsters to destroy. It's the friend and the well-wisher to the freedom of all. It's the guarantor only of its own. Um, for those who want to get back to nation building at home, who think we've become overcommitted with 800 military bases overseas, that sort of thing, John Quincy Adams is being evoked and our early tradition more and more. Uh, because the view of a Pax Americana or any kind of an empire was not on in the 19th century. Uh, if you've been to the National Gallery of Art, there's a room on the first floor with five massive paintings from the late 1830s by Thomas Cole. And it's called The Cycle of Empire. And it shows a kind of a bucolic scene, the rise of commerce. Um, this shows the destruction. And then it's a it's a bucolic scene again, except with ruins. Um, and the basic idea is that empire is evil. Empires will be struck down by God. Uh, and therefore, uh, we're blessed that America does not have that conceit. And so uh, this is very typical. It was in the art. It was in the literature, in the political speeches of the time. And it's interesting. This book came out recently. Uh, I highly recommend it, The True Flag by Steve Kinzer. Um, he documents what happened when uh, first McKinley and then Teddy Roosevelt tried to begin steering the U.S. in a different direction, toward empire. It was a Donnybrook. There was a 40-day debate in, Senate, in the Senate about this, and leading the charge against these changes was Mark Twain and his poison pen. Uh, Mark Twain was really on the barricades during what, in retrospect, was a fulcrum period. Uh, as the U.S., yes, did begin its territorial expansion, especially toward Asia. And it was the two world wars that brought us in. Um, the tragic, tragic, tragic First World War. Um, you can see how little movement there was for all the millions of deaths. Uh, there was almost no movement uh, in terms of changing territory. And Woodrow Wilson arrived uh, at Versailles with 14 points. Um, all of them very idealistic, national self-determination, human rights, with the idea that the U.S. would enforce, would help to enforce these globally. Now, this, this was a whole new tone that came in to U.S. foreign policy, and this sort of Wilsonian versus our early president's view of the world is still there under the, sur under the surface um, because we've had Wilsonianism on steroids uh, in recent decades. Um, now... Obviously, the U.S. withdrew again after World War I. Uh, we put up high tariff walls during the, uh, during the Depression. We've always had tariffs. The United States, uh, all through the 19th century, had high tariff walls. We were not a free trading nation. Um, that's how we financed ourselves. There was no income tax until 1913. Everything was financed through tariffs. Um, I, w I don't see us going back to that necessarily, but uh, let's say tariffs are part of our history. World War II. There again, maps show something. I mean, it's, it's amazing how small the axis was, actually. Um, and that is, of course, what brought us structurally into uh, the Pax Americana, the famous meetings between FDR, Churchill, and Stalin. And just as important, right around the same time, the first meetings with Ibn Saud. Uh, this is the beginning of the double bargain uh, with Saudi Arabia over oil, which still drives our policy today. That also dates from the end of World War II. Now, coming into the 1950s and so, the world was divided. It was a world of walls, but the walls were built by the other side. The Berlin Wall, the Iron Curtain, China walling itself off. We were for tearing down all those walls. We were for an open world. Um, uh, but they, and, and you know, in retrospect, this was a cocoon. We were, in a sense, protected from the labor, cheap labor that was out, that's been out in the world since 1978 and the 1980s. 
Um, many Western countries look back at the period, 1945 to 75, as what the French call the 30 glorious years, uh, in which there was equality, there wasn't a lot of the disruptions to the economy. It was based on an artificial situation of walls built by the other side. Now, early on, the warnings began. And this maybe is this old moralism about empire resurfing, resurfacing. Walter Lippmann, one of the main commentators of that era, issued uh, a warning which now has come to be called the, the Lippmann Gap, in which he said, okay, the US can get involved this way, but it must always keep a balance of, uh, of, of uh, it, it must not go into debt, it must keep a balance of resources to allow, uh, to allow the foreign policy to go forward. Um, and um, it, otherwise, he said it will lose the support of the American people. And with the Vietnam War, another warning came. The Vietnam War is when we really began to go into debt. It's what led us to detach the dollar from gold, the famous Nixon shocks, to finance the Vietnam War. war. Um, and Charles Kindleberger, probably the most noted economist of the last century, warned at the time, he said, the United States is going to be on a downward trend from here because the anchor that kept us responsible in terms of our fiscality is gone. The dollar is now uh, simply something notional. It's not anchored to anything. The US will be able to print money uh, at will. And, and we did run up tremendous deficits after the Vietnam War. Um, now, 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall. 1991, the collapse of the Soviet Union. This built upon the opening of China and led to a whole new a whole new period um, in which, as I say, Wilson on steroids, we began to export democracy um, around the world in the 1990s, 2000s. Um, it was called transformational diplomacy. Once again, very active, trying to bring what they called the Washington Consensus, the Pax Americana, into new regions. Now, 9-11 added a new twist, obviously, uh, as we got involved in the Middle East. Uh, very expensive wars. The Iraq war was kept off budget. It was secret. The budget was secret. Congress was not allowed to see it. Um, you know, Immanuel Kant, not, not to get too wonky here, but um, um, wrote once that a republic on perpetual peace was the name of, the, of, of his tract. A country will, a republic will not go to war. A republic in which the citizens have a say will tend not to go to war because the citizens are not gonna to wanna to fight a war. Two conditions must be met. All citizens must be equally subject to military service. Otherwise, the elites are free to play with policy. And of course, we had that during the Vietnam War, but ever since, we've had no draft. And second, he said there should be an international convention. No country at war should be allowed to run a deficit because it hides the true cost of the adventure from the people. Um, well, with 9-11 uh, and our wars in the Middle East, uh, we have run up a huge uh, five to seven trillion dollar probably uh, um, budget item here. And th part, this is part of what led um, Paul Kennedy, uh, who was a historian at Yale, um, to begin to reflect on the situation in the United States in light of history. And a very famous book of his, The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers, which is a standard text now. He, he looked at history and said, okay, what is it that leads a power to decline? And he said there are two things. Number one, if it overstretches, he called it imperial overstretch, it starts to act beyond its means, uh, kind of a hubris given its position in the world. And secondly, it must stay on top of the technology, the emerging technology and the economy of the era. Large powers sometimes will get lazy. Um, and by the way, one of the main reasons that we're reacting against China now is precisely that. We see them perhaps leaping ahead of us in tech. So both of Paul Kennedy's admonitions, I think, are, are relevant here. Now this brings us to what's happening uh, with the country that is rising uh, in this era. I've just described our situation and what I think are some of the pitfalls um, we have engaged in and may be engaging in. Uh, China is run by engineers. Almost the entire leadership historically have been engineers. We, of course, have a lot of lawyers in our Congress. Um, I, I, whether engineers are better at long-term planning, at infrastructure, I don't know. 
But the Chinese have embarked, as I'm sure you've all read, on what may be a game changer, one of the largest, maybe the largest infrastructure programs in history. And it's something the United States is actively opposing. We're trying to dissuade all of our allies from getting involved. The One Belt, One Road, it's called the Belt and Road Initiative, the New Silk Road, which the Chinese roll out about 14, 2014. This is a huge, huge endeavor um, to build high-speed rail, three high-speed rail lines, ports, infrastructure of all kinds through the entire Eurasian space. Think of that second map because Eurasia is now about to be knotted together. Um, there are problems with this. Uh, you know, we, we, we have ample reasons for criticizing it. People are going into debt. Other countries are going into debt. But the Chinese are pressing forward with this. Uh, historically, this is actually quite significant. You know, this Silk Road was the center of the global economy for, for much of history. The, the Han, Han Dynasty in China and, the, and Rome were connected uh, by a land route, a very active one, which continued it, into the Muslim era. The largest cities in the world were along the Silk Road, Merv, Baghdad. And in the 1200s, 1300s, it fell apart. Uh, Mongol invasions, but also the Great Plague, which started in China and swept across into Europe. Uh, the final blow was the fall of, of Constantinople. Uh, suddenly, this route was closed off. And it led to what historians call the maritime shift. And the maritime shift is the modern era. It is the modern economy. It's the, it's the economy that Europe and the United States um, emerged in, all by sea. Uh, the technology of shipbuilding and, and, and shipping um, increased in that period. None of the empires, European empires, that were developed were done by land. Uh, um, the British could not get to India by land. The Dutch could not get to Indonesia by land. It was all by sea. And of course, we were populated with European settlement also by sea. In the modern era, containerization has allowed this to dominate um, the global economy. We can, we can ship vast amounts. But what if the Chinese plan now will structurally change this? This has tremendous implications for the U.S. role in the world. Uh, here are the 80 countries that are involved. Uh, pretty much all of our uh, European allies are involved because a lot of the, this infrastructure will go into Europe. Just yesterday, Italy announced that it's going to be a full participant, and um, we are quite angry with the populist Italian government about that. And you can see the structures of future alliances beginning to develop. As China makes Pakistan a major route for this, um, works closely with Russia, India is freaking out. Uh, they and Japan have their own Silk Road initiative to try to work in Eurasia. Um, uh, India is urging us to get closer to Iran to counteract. Anyway, this is, this is the adumbration of future alliances that will be quite different from the old NATO-Warsaw Pact. Um, and the fact that global warming is leading to a melting in the far north, I, I go up to Duluth quite a bit, and believe me, the northern cities in Canada and the U.S. are all about this. Um, shipping will eventually go across the, the seas north of Eurasia, uh, eliminating 35 days or, well, anyway, it'll be much quicker, even if it goes by sea. So Europe and, 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 um, and Asia will be linked up, potentially, more and more along this route. Now, um, because of this, of this map, Russia is drawing closer and closer to China. Um, and this is a major geopolitical result of, frankly, of our policies, in which uh, we have been going hard at Russia for good reason, and now uh, with, with China, they're teaming up more and more. They have a common interest. Um, they're not challenging us globally, but each country wants to create what they call strategic depth in its own region. So for China, that's what they call the first island chain there. It includes the South China Sea and Taiwan. We've, we had a Monroe Doctrine during our whole history. This is their equivalent. They want to have sway or at least a say over what happens in that region. And they're developing the military technology to deny us access. One reason that Washington's freaking out. And with Russia, this is a map that kind of shows how things look from Moscow and St. Petersburg, where the Baltic states, Ukraine, uh, Georgia, are coming right up. Um, they, they're drawing lines, and uh, with Chinese support now, are saying no further uh, when it comes to Ukraine, Georgia. And, you know, we just pulled out of the INF Treaty um, uh, just, uh, just a, a couple of days, well, a couple of months ago. And 
Putin has announced that if we deploy these mid-range missiles in Europe, Russia will deploy a new weapon called the Zircon missile. This is hypersonic. It cannot be stopped or detected. It will be placed on small submarines planted under the sea just 250 miles or more off our coast in, in international waters. They'll be able to hit the Pentagon and all of our command and control centers in five minutes. Um, and they're, they're threatening to put these off our, both of our coasts. So this is starting to get a little bit dicey, especially the arms race aspect of this. Um, now, I come back to that map. A, because of our blessed geography, uh, it's really since the war, and I've been to so many conferences where they discuss this, the basic US geopolitical situation is this. We dominate our region. That is what allows us to project power without worrying about what happens at home. That's why our Navy is everywhere except home. We don't want any other country to have that luxury. We want to deny the Chinese in Asia, and we want to deny the Russians in Europe from having that. Um, the problem is they see these areas as adjacent. Um, if, we, if we allow that, then we no longer will have the back of our European and Asian allies. That's the problem. Do we want Germany and Japan to go nuclear? Um, that would happen if, so the, the, this is a real geopolitical dilemma uh, that, that will take a lot to, uh, to unravel. So the US, having gone through three phases with China, first, make them a responsible stakeholder, encourage them into the world economy, into the WTO, on the assumption that they will change, become more like us. Remember, this is a different civilization. Um, then President, uh, President Obama, the pivot, which was to start hedging militarily, but now we have a whole new approach. Um, Jim Mattis, uh, a, a year ago, declared the new national security strategy of the US. In a nutshell, terrorism is no longer the threat. It's a, it's a problem, but it's not the threat. The threat is China and Russia, revisionist powers that are trying to do, undo the international order, i.e. Pax Americana, and are working against US interests, and we therefore must challenge them. We must maintain uh, military superiority over them. This is the task going forward. Um, and it goes so far as to say that it was a mistake to bring China into the world economy, and we should force them back out. Now, uh, that's a tall order. Um, I'm, but there are a number of things that we're doing right now that would, so, our, our initial reaction, we're going to increase our military spending by trillions of dollars going forward, if Congress approves. Uh, it's at 750 now. That's an old chart. It's, it's at 750 going up over $800 million. Um, this is on the heels of a $1.5 uh, trillion dollar tax cut. And I come back to Walter Lippmann, to Paul Kennedy, to Kindleberger, uh, in terms of the wherewithal for these policies. Um, these are the four horsemen of the tariff apocalypse. Um, <laughs> you've got Steve Mnuchin, Wilbur Ross, Robert Lighthizer, who is the main brains behind everything, and then Peter Navarro, who's kind of the cheerleader, author of a book called Death by China, you can imagine. Um, and we are threatening tariffs. Uh, the talks are going on, but we're threatening the Chinese with 25% tariffs on almost all their imports. We're threatening the Europeans and the Japanese as well with 25% tariffs on their cars. Um, might have been better to bring all our allies together in putting pressure on China, but that's, we're doing the, all this bilaterally now. And of course, as I mentioned, tech is key here. Um, you know, uh, Meng Wanzhou, the, the daughter of the founder of Huawei, has, is under arrest in Canada. If she is extradited here, uh, watch out. I mean, the Chinese will lose face, and it could get, it could get very tense. Um, but their hearings, extradition hearings are underway right now. We are saying that our laws are extraterritorial um, on, on, the, on this. So yes, we're very worried about Chinese tech. Um, here is the, uh, this is the most latest sort of chart, pie chart of glo global debt. Um, you can see we're still number one. Um, and um, in any event, this is something I, I believe that, that in terms of our strength is something we have to really watch. Um, the, the problem too is this, um, as I say, our allies are are, there are more and more points of disagreement with our European allies when really we need their, their support to keep these structures afloat. 
Uh, Donald Trump's first trip as president was to Saudi Arabia, not to Canada or Mexico or Europe. Uh, MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, is uh, very popular in this administration in spite of everything. Uh, close to Jared Kushner, we have moved our embassy to Jerusalem. Um, Jared Kushner is about to announce a Middle East peace plan. This is giving our European allies heartburn, especially our decision to pull out of the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, John Bolton is working with, it's very much like the run-up to Iraq, uh, working with the emigre community um, from Iran, including the, 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 the son of the Shah, um, in establishing a, a, a government in exile. Um, and the Europeans are sticking by the deal. They're still trying to work with Iran. Um, we're threatening them with sanctions. So this is, as I say, um, um, a worrying thing that at a time when we're starting to look at China and the other trends, we are at loggerheads with our European allies on so many things. Um, now, in addition to this, the, uh, you know, I, the, the West is shrinking demographically, but um, on issues of governance and tech, there's also an issue here. The Western world isn't really that big, if you look at it. Um, Freedom House, which monitors uh, democracy around the world, um, said that 20, 2017 was the worst year for, 2018 was the worst year for democracy uh, since World War II. For the 13th straight year, there's been a decline in the number of democratic states, and they pointed to the US as we went down two notches in terms of our democracy. So um, when it comes to tech, but also when it comes to governance, there is a challenge and there's a nervousness in Washington because it seems as if for all their faults, and believe me, China has a lot of problems. I mean, pollution, inequality, uh, debt, hidden debt, um, that some of these non-democratic governments are starting to outperform um, and certainly to, uh, to engage in long-term planning. A statistic that really st sticks in my mind, there are 50 unicorns in the world. A unicorn is a tech company worth a trillion dollars or more. Um, of those 50, 26 are Chinese, 16 are American, and none of them are European. Now, uh, the top five unicorns in the US and in Europe, if you look at how they use their profits, in the last five years, the top five US tech unicorns have spent $228 billion on stock buybacks and dividends. Chinese, 10. Our highly financialized system, um, is it adaptive given the technologies that are out there today, given the kind of planning and infrastructure that is necessary? What if societies like China are, at least in the short term, more adaptive? Um, I don't think that's true, but Washington is you can, you can just see people are seeing it in those terms. Because China is basically announcing a new form of governance. They, st they strongly believe that they understand best how to use modern technologies for governance. Um, and, and to this extent, they, they believe they've kind of leapt ahead of us in some of this um, for the good of all. Um, what, what do I mean? They're putting facial recognition cameras up all over China. Uh, if you want to get toilet paper in a remote village in Xinjiang, you have to go through facial recognition. There's a lot of theft of toilet paper, so once you get it, you don't get another roll for, for 12 days. Um, it's that focused. This is what they call translational tech, that as tech is developed, it's translated, implemented immediately. Um, if you're crossing an intersection in Beijing, Shanghai, Tianjin nowadays, there are these big screens. Um, and these are wide streets. If you jaywalk, by the time you're halfway across the street, your photo and all your personal data appears on the screen. Now, I mean, that's embarrassing enough, but it means that it's been registered by the government. More and more, police are wearing these glasses. A, an enterprising New York Times journalist a few months ago, he wrote a big article about this too, uh, convinced one of these police to lend out their glasses. The journalist put them on, looked at someone across the way, and that person's photo popped up on the inside of the lens, along with the data. This is like within, the Chinese have announced that they can do this within three seconds, roughly, with the technology they're using. 
Um, the idea is to have a social credit system for the good of all that will monitor the behavior uh, of the population, online behavior, how they're picked up on the uh, facial recognition, all that sort of thing. It'll go into a computer and you'll get a score. And depending on that score, there'll be immediate rewards and punishments. Now, the techies in China, the Jack Ma's and everyone are fully on board for this. Um, and in fact, one of them made a speech recently in which they said, well, now wait a minute, it's the same thing in the US. This data, the technology exists, Pandora's box is open. Um, and it's being used. The difference is that in, this is a quote, in, in the United States, it's being used by semi-autistic libertarians in Silicon Valley <laughs> for their own purposes. And by the way, under the Homeland Security Act, they have to give that data to the US government if asked. So the idea is, well, well why not? Why, 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 why shouldn't we use this rationally? It exists. Um, I mentioned this is a different civilization, right? China is, a, this is not the Anglo-Saxon sphere. Um, and one of the strong traditions in addition to Confucianism is legalism, which was the sort of the philosophy at the time the Qin Dynasty was founded. Han Feizi, you hear a lot about him in China. Basically, people are not naturally good. They're evil, they'll only act out of self-interest and will only respond to rewards and punishments. Therefore, social order requires a strong leader enforcing laws and in, in this current iteration through tech. So I am fascinated by the, the challenge of governance and wh what kind of governance do these new technologies portend? And one of the most interesting aspects of this trade-off uh, that's going on now, I think, lies in that area. I'm going to conclude now. Um, you know, it's, it's ironic that just a few years ago when Xi Jinping met with Obama for their first summit, it was at Sunnylands in California, um, the Chinese came with a full agenda and she said, I, let's just the two of us talk with a translator. That, that happens. I mean, it happened with Trump, it happens. That's not that unusual. Um, and at the top of the Chinese agenda was Thucydides. Now, Thucydides in the Peloponnesian Wars describes the first war that we really have a record of. And in, in summing up why it happened, he wrote, he wrote, and the rise of Athens alarmed the other Greeks. And so Xi Jinping's question to Obama was, how alarmed are you? History is against us. This is literally what the Chinese message was. You know, if you, you know, because um, it's true, historically, if you have a, a Pax Americana or a kind of a, of a status quo system and a rising power challenges that system, there's often war. Um, and the Chinese were saying, look, history is against us, but we have to really focus um, and develop a new type of great power relations. And by the way, that's what's in all the communiques now. Um, I think it's interesting as an example of, of uh, the civilizational aspect of the Chinese reaching into Western civilization to try to talk to us. Um, all Chinese students know about Thucydides today. It's, it's all through their educational system. Um, and um, Graham Allison's book, which you can still get at Barnes and Noble, he looks at uh, 16 examples of what we have going today, rising power, 12 end in war uh, in his. So um, this kind of a transition is fraught with, uh, with danger and confusion. You know, it's exactly the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I. Um, uh, there's a new movie out called They Shall Not Grow Old. It's a documentary done by Peter Jackson of Lord of the Rings. He spent years and used all the modern tech to colorize um, footage, film footage from World War I. It looks like it was yesterday. If you see this, it's like these are people that you could bump into uh, anywhere today. Um, and one of the best books about that period was The Sleepwalkers by Christopher Clark, because in many ways, Europe went sleepwalking into a catastrophe. Germany had united, Germany was rising, Britain felt challenged, very similar to what we have going today. And whatever happens with the Pax Americana, we have to not sleepwalk. We have to take these issues very, very seriously as they're developing. Um, and obviously that US-Chinese relationship is the key. So I'll stop there, I went on a bit too long and I look very much forward to your questions. Thank you.
th thank you, Tom. Very fascinating. A little depressing, maybe, but uh, so so we're gonna. I'm sure change some, is good. <laughs> yeah, so, some uh, but uh, good stuff for us all to think about. So you you all know how this works. Time for questions, answers. If you'll raise your hands, we'll get a microphone to you. So wait for that. I'll call on you, and Tom will answer. So we'll start right here in the middle. If you consider what happened to Britain and our transition to Pax Americana, they seem to be doing okay. Is there a way for us to transition out of Pax Americana without ending up in turmoil? That's a very good question. You know, I, I'm a member of the USA Working Group of the British International Studies Association, so there are periodic um, conferences with <coughs> academics from all over Britain, and there's a group of of young scholars at the University of Birmingham that everyone calls the Birmingham declinists who are trying to instruct us, they're, they're coming up with, with, with examples of what we could learn, exactly what you said. Um, you know, the way that they were able to decline so elegantly was to become Greece to our Rome. Uh, as I say, that transition was within a cultural space. Uh, Britain assumed a kind of a, a Nestor mentorship role to us. Uh, you know, they kind of wove their way into our popular culture uh, and um, have done quite well. Um, and that's part of, the, part of their trauma with Brexit. Uh, they, that, transit, that transatlantic uh, link is to this day stronger than their relationship to the, to the, to the continent. Um, Churchill once said, you know, Britain must always be uh, distant from the continent. You know, that was Churchill's. And so, uh, so the country is, is, um, is struggling. But that, that was kind of a, a special case, you know. Um, uh, you know, the decline of Rome led to the barbarian invasions and all kinds of things. I, I think, in my view, this, the transition underway today, first of all, many people think that, you know, China is not ready to to really assume the kind of role we've had. They, see, they still them see, see themselves as a developing country, a big developing country. Um, and it's true, they have a lot of problems that they're gonna have to deal with, and they want a peaceful environment to do it within. So they're not about to step into that kind of a role, I don't think. Economically, yes, structural, like the, 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 the One Belt, One Road. So people like Richard Haas at, um, at, the, at the Council on Foreign Relations are worried about a kind of a, you know, not, not multipolar, not bipolar, but but no polar. In other words, there's going to be a period now of real fragmentation. Henry Kissinger is writing about the dangers of a regionalization of the global economy and global politics, where now if that's the case, we'll be increasingly thrown back on our own region. I'm not sure I buy that argument, but um, we're heading into a multipolar situation where we're going to have to work with numerous countries to try to keep everything in order. It's going to take tremendous diplomacy. Uh, sanctions won't be enough. Military won't be enough, in my view. Uh, and you know, we've been defunding our diplomacy. In the last few years, China has increased its spending on diplomacy by 40%. We've cut ours by 40%. So um, I, I guess I don't think there's any way to decline elegantly without being very nimble. And um, you know, the Chinese have a, a, a doctrine of names in Confucianism. You, if you don't give, give things their proper name, there's chaos. And I think we've got to start naming things accurately and be very rigorous about it. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. I have a question over here on the left side. I have spent probably my entire life in opposition to the United States marching throughout the world, saving the world. And in many respects, I don't know how the rest of you feel, because I think some of you have been in the same place I have been in, and maybe are in the same place now. But for the United States to finally step out of having to lead everybody into everything, and the resources that it requires, and our own unwillingness to be honest about it and to finance it, makes me wonder if the isolationist uh, period that we had before the war, First World War doesn't have a lot to recommend itself. And it probably needs a lot of updating, a, a lot of changing. But I see us focusing now on China as we always now, in my lifetime at least, we always have to have the opposition. We had the Russians. Now we don't have the Russians. 
except uh, on, a, on a lesser scale, but we don't seem to have them in the same way that we did. Now it's China. I remember reading, and I'm sorry for going on yeah, let's, for let's, so let's get a question here, so. Oh, get to the question. Yeah, yeah I guess the question, <laughs> yeah, uh, okay, I'm done lecturing. But at any rate, uh, Japan was the big boogeyman for a while. I remember banks were all bigger in, in Japan than they were in the United States. Japan's educational system, okay, let's step down for once. It seems to me all the argument is in favor of let's confront China. Let's be worried about China. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I think what you're describing is what they call in Washington um, enemy deprivation syndrome. Um, I was at our U.S. I was at the embassy in um, in uh, in Moscow when the Soviet Union was falling apart, and I remember being at a at a dinner at Spasso House, and I was sitting next to a Russian general. He was a Early guy, he, he was festooned with medals from the Battle of Kursk, you know, the largest tank battle in history. And as often happens, uh, he, he got drunk, and he got increasingly drunk. And so I, I suddenly felt this this weight as he's kind of starting to lean like this. He was, and he, his last sentient words were, "Thomas," he said, "We're going to do the worst thing to your country that anyone can do. We're going to deprive you of a th threat." You know, and then he passed out, you know. Um, <laughs> it, I mean, it is true that, 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 when, that during the Cold War, they used to say water stop, you know, um, politics stops at the water's edge, right? There was a clear sense of the threat. Um, and th there was a kind of a, the rules of the game in our domestic debate about foreign affairs. When the Soviet Union fell apart, it was like the world became demagnetized. You, could see, you, could saw it in, you saw it in the Balkans, you could see it everywhere. That threat, that, that coalescing threat was gone. And I think we've been subliminally at least looking for a new one ever since. Um, terrorism for a while, but I mean terrorism is an instrument. You really can't make that the threat. Now we've got some real, you know, blood and bone, as we see it, threats emerging, um, we think. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I, you know, Obama talked about nation building at home. Even George W. Bush, when he first came in, said, we're not going to send the National Guard. You know, before 9-11, he, he ran on but not doing the kind of things we've been doing. I, you know, I think we, and, and during the 90s and into the 2000s, after 9-11, the Bush administration, the first, second Bush, ha had something called transformational diplomacy. And the idea was to, to uh, counter terrorism, we had to promote freedom around the world. He linked the two. He said, wherever the human heart is not free, there can be a terrorist threat. And he told the UN in 2006, the US reserves the right to intervene militarily anywhere in the world in the name of human freedom. Now that was Wilsonianism on steroids. Uh, it's very clear that the American electorate is reacting against that now. That's part of what Trump got elected on. And um, so I think that the parameters are, are narrowing for the kind of adventures we've been in. But, there's got to be a sweet space between going back to total isolationism. I mean, I, if, if we could just get a more multipolar view, see our, find ways to maximize our position in light of these trends, um, uh, that, that, and not always relying on sanctions in our military, if there's some way to do that without going all the way the other way. Okay, great. Tom, we have one over here. Uh, given your presentation of the sweep of history and the flow of all the changes, uh, ignoring the Trump administration for this discussion, uh, the leadership and the behaviors of both our parties, Democrats and Republicans, uh, seem to not be very good in the last 30 years or so. Where's the leadership going to come from to keep us from sleepwalking any longer? That's a that that's the the key the key question. I mean, you know, Obama and his staff used to refer to the blob. Right, which is a sort of the Washington elite that kind of goes like, like Bob Kagan I showed you, who goes back and forth between the two parties. Um, there's been a kind of a consensus, you know, in the 1990s. Remember the book by Francis Fukuyama, The End of History. You know, Western values, the Western system had prevailed. It was the end of history, and so why wouldn't we simply promote it, uh, if necessarily militarily? Now, I think that there's a morning after now. Um, what I'm concerned about, looking at it at the university, during the Cold War, and I'll make this short, during the Cold War, 
uh, with the Soviet threat, th there was tremendous focus on area studies, on trying to understand what made them tick. And immigre professors like Kissinger, Brzezinski, Marshall Schulman, you know, were, were key. Once the Soviet Union collapsed, area studies collapsed in our universities. They are gone. And people study Russian and, and, um, uh, and other cult cultures in a prism of how to transform it. They study you know, uh, human rights, or they study your responsibility to protect, they study various things, and do the languages within that. Um, and I think we have to get back to area studies. You know, um, and and I, uh, I'm part of a group led by uh, George Breslauer at Berkeley trying to do that. Um, but it's a tough slog. Everyone wants to study business or computers or a you know, startup nowadays. You know, it's like, um, you know, in 1957 when Sputnik went up, it was a tech challenge, we responded with the National Defense Education Act. We spent massively on our education. Today, we're responding with walls and military spending. Big difference, okay, right here in the middle. Well, that gentleman asked a good question about where will the leadership come from, so I would nominate you. Let's just, <laughs> let's just say, <laughs> let's just say, Mr. I, Hansen, that you are the, the new leader now. I, I try to mentor at least. <laughs> <laughs> so what would be your top three policy changes or enhancements um, that would put us on a different track or on the correct track? <clears throat> well, top three, yeah. I, uh, well, these are all so structural. You know, there, there, there's just a plethora of books out nowadays about democracy, right? I mean, I, I think our strength comes from our traditions, from, our, uh, from a vibrant democracy. Um, so, that, so to make ourselves strong, I would focus there first. And most of the books that are out now cite one factor, and that's inequality, as a key to what's happening, to the rise of populism, to the rise of uh, anti-globalist sentiment, all that sort of thing. It's a big, tall, it's a tall order, it's a domestic order. Um, secondly, um, you know, the, the, at the end of the Cold War, I was active in all the meetings with Gorbachev and stuff, and the first Bush very much conceived of a common European home with Russia. Um, he would not have expanded NATO the way we did. We, we, we have encroached way into the Russian space. Uh, if you're Polish, if you're from East Europe, you, that is, of course, why wouldn't you do that? You have to do that. But at a certain point, there's got to be some kind of reconciliation with the, the larger powers. There's got to be some kind of an understanding. Um, I know some of the realists are saying that the best solution for Ukraine, for example, would be um, what happened to Austria in 1955. You know, Austria was occupied just like Germany by the four powers. Vienna was a four power city. Um, the most popular, well, it was voted the best city and uh, best movie in British history by the British, British Film Institute last year, The Third Man, is set in quadripartite Vienna. And in 1955, Eisenhower and Khrushchev signed a deal. Uh, everyone pulls out, Austria becomes neutral, but they can trade with anybody. And it's called bye-bye day in Austria. It's a national day. And they, they, so a country like Ukraine should not be asked to choose. It, it, there'll be a war if this goes any further. Um, it's not that you wanna make deals over other people's heads, but there's gotta be some reconciliation at that level. Um, so, and I would, seek, I would seek some kind of an accommodation with China. You know, when, when Obama first came in, there was talk about a G2, that China and the US would just kind of divide up the world. It doesn't have to be this kind of, and then I would, you know, uh, we're hitting over 800 uh, trillion dollars, a billion dollars in defense spending. We're fighting four different wars at the same time. All the vested interest lobbies, it, it's incredibly inefficient. And so we gotta get a handle on the military lobbies on on, on our military spending. Because um, frankly, I don't see, I mean, with, with the tax cuts and with our military spending, there aren't enough domestic programs to cut. There really aren't. And so we gotta get our fiscality. So I guess those three things. Okay, great. Back here, Worth, Anastasia. The last two questions have sort of answered much of my question. But it seems to me that, that this country, that we have abrogated our responsibility as citizens. We did it in the first Gulf War. We, we sent other kids to fight, and we didn't even pay the bill. And we have never paid it since, and we have never stepped up since. It seems to me there's an inherent contradiction or, or conflict 
between capitalism and democracy. Now, I'm not in favor of socialism, but the capitalism needs to be controlled. And this comes back to what you just said about the debt, because uh, capitalism is all about acquiring wealth. And once you have a lot of it, it's easy to get a lot more. And so uh, we don't care to distribute that very equitably. And until we begin to do that, it seems to me this is, should be number one on the agenda. And number two, I think we should think about getting rid of a volunteer army so that everybody's got skin in the game. Yeah, well that's, as you say, we've abrogated a responsibility. That's exactly the Immanuel Kant point, that, that if, if, if the situation is that way, that the elites are not, you know, after 9-11, George Bush said, the best thing you can do is go shopping. Remember, he literally said that. He said, we're at war. This is a war like World War II. But by the way, and I have students up at UMD who have been on five tours out in that region now. It's, it's ridiculous, and it includes the National Guard, you know? So um, the other thing is this. You know, there's a separation of powers in our system, and the Congress has significant powers over foreign policy, um, passing treaties and nominations, but Congress has abrogated its responsibility. The average congressman today does not want to stick their neck out. They don't want to take a position on these issues. Um, and so, yeah, how we get our institutions back in line. A lot of the deregulation of our economy happened under both administrations. The most fateful steps on um, Futures Trading Act and Glass-Steagall were taken under Clinton. So it's been a bipartisan undoing of really what was the result of World War II and the Depression. Um, and and I, it's, it's easier to undo something than to put it back. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I really look at how we can get our own house in order uh, in order to have any role in the world in strength. Yeah. Hey, so. right in the middle here, Vivian. Oh, okay, question and answer. Do you have one right here in the front? Hi, you've par partly talked about this. Yeah. But one of the things I don't understand is if we are moving towards isolationism, why are we expanding the military? And if we've got a military that's bigger than, I believe, the next five countries, are we ineffective or inefficient or, or what? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> you know, the, the, I, the idea in Washington, theoretically, this administration does not want to send troops. Right? They, you know, we dropped the mother of all bombs on, on Syria. We're sending military aid to Ukraine. Um, we're exhorting Guaido in, in Venezuela, but we're short of sending troops. We're using, frankly, food as a weapon down there, saying you'll get food only if you change the government, which th there are UN laws against using food that way. Um, but, um, but the military spending, you know, there are a lot of vested interests, a lot, you know, our domestic economy, it does create jobs. Um, and and I, I, if you look at the national security strategy, there really is a sense. What, what Mattis said was, since 9-11, and this was actually an indirect critique of the Iraq war, he said, our military has declined in all areas. It has been worn down by these commitments in the Middle East and by insufficient military spending. Therefore, we have to build back and meet the challenge from Russia and China. And, and it means a whole new generation of nuclear weapons, which is what they're working on. Um, as I say, there's, we're fighting all these different wars at the same time. Um, and I, I just think it's not, I, it's not the right response. We need a diplomatic response to what's going on here. You know, the official US Army history of the Iraq war, which came out last month, they've been working on it for years, concluded that there was one victor from the Iraq war, Iran. That's the official assessment of the US Army. Interesting. Vivian, over here on the left side. What do you see the role of North Korea being? Well, North Korea, yes. Um, the vehicle to a Nobel Prize, Peace Prize for Donald Trump? <laughs> <laughs> I, think he's, I think he's dreaming of that. Um, you know, he's sticking in there with, you know, this love affair, you know, this, this romantic exchange of letters which caused them to fall in love. Um, <laughs> that's what Trump says, you know, they're in love. Um, the basic problem is this, that, that the, like a lot of countries, North Korea feels that we'd like to change their regime. And recent history has shown that the only way you can prevent the U.S. from doing that is to have nuclear weapons. The, the, the one country after Iraq where we 
showed our shock and awe. The one country that stopped its nuclear program was, was Libya. And look what happened to Gaddafi. So, um, it's, it's, so the basic issue is this, that the North Koreans are not going to give up their whole nuclear program. They will, they will go step by step, cut it back, cut it back, for easing of sanctions. They eventually want a peace treaty with us. They want, they want security guarantees from us. Uh, and the basic misunderstanding is we want them to denuclearize, then they'll get all that. They want to start getting those things and then slowly cut back. Um, you know, China um, is still supporting them. Uh, South Korea right now is getting closer and closer to North Korea. Uh, so, you know, there are limits on what we can do unless we want to fight a war over their heads. It is true that the, the North Koreans now have missiles that theoretically can reach the entire U.S. And um, how accurate they are, nobody knows. Um, they have probably 20 to 30 nuclear weapons at this point. Um, once again, the accuracy is, is hard to determine. Um, I'm, I'm glad that, he's, that, that they're, they're still talking. I mean, I'm glad that this is, you know, that they're working with it. Um, but, uh, in a, you know, the, the ideal would be an eventual denuclearization of the peninsula. Um, we are, uh, if Kim Jong-un has stopped nuclear testing, we ha are not doing the large exercises anymore that we were doing with South Korea, so that, that's still in place. Um, so we'll see where this love affair goes. I, I hope it's consummated at some point. Okay, <laughs> back here. Specifically with respect to the U.S. and China, what are the parameters that you would see that would enable us to have a constructive conversation with the Chinese as opposed to an all-out confrontation with them, given the underlying considerable differences in our, in our uh, geopolitical viewpoint and our history. Yes, yeah. It's, um, it's, it's, it's tough. You know, one thing, I think there's a reservoir of goodwill in both countries. You know, the Chinese like America, the average Chinese, so many of them have studied here. You know, coming out of the 19th century, we always had a romantic view of China, you know, that this sort of civil, full circle of civilization and, you know, all the missionaries that went out there. Um, you know, it's, it, there doesn't, I think there doesn't have to be this degree of misunderstanding, but the problem is that unlike the Soviet Union in the Cold War, this is a real challenge. I mean, we had no economic contact with the Soviets. Their economy was based on, uh, you know, old industry and military spending, they were not an, uh, an identity threat or an existential threat to us. This is different. We, you know, when you see the possibility that they may be getting ahead of us in tech, that their system might be outperforming us, that our allies are gravitating toward them, this, th th you know, this is, it's gonna, it, it's gonna cause a, a reassessment of, of our identity and our position in the world. And that's a tall order. You know, when you've had it good, when you've been on top, there's no incentive to reassess. There's no incentive to give different names to things. You know, I, I was on a conference in Shanghai a few years ago in which a, a Chinese academic slash party guy uh, was talking and he, he organized his speech around three points. Things that, are, things that have changed, things that are changing, and things that haven't changed yet and why they haven't. And he was welcoming them all, right? It, 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 as I say, this is the sort of Chinese cyclical. So we're almost going to have to buy into the Chinese view that they are, that, that their time now is coming, that, that we can't treat them anymore like we did during the Opium Wars or whatever, that this is, that, that this is a real, what Washington calls peer competitor. And that's going to cause, that's going to necessitate a, a rethinking, frankly, of our position. And that's hard. That's, it, that, when I look at my students, I think they are, this generation coming up, not even the millennials, but the ones I'm seeing coming up now are there. They are there both in terms of, of how our economy should be organized. I mean, they, you know, the, um, the Economist had a big cover two weeks ago, Millennial Socialism, I don't know if you saw that. You know, and of course, that's going to be the big issue in our campaign now, right? That's socialism. Um, but I think there's going to be some generational shifts coming along in our country, but um, it's going to take time. And a lot of these issues, you know, need to be addressed quickly. Okay, Vivian has, I think, maybe two back here. We'll take one for now. So I've uh, heard that we get the government we 
uh, deserve. And I'm wondering what you might recommend to us as individuals uh, in a democratic structure about what we should do or say to influence um, what our government does. Um, since Citizens United, that is a very tall order. And so I think as citizens, we gotta focus in on the structure of our politics. Um, the gerrymandering that's going on, the, uh, uh, the money in politics. Uh, you know, when you travel around the world, you don't see attack ads like we have. You just don't see it. Um, you also don't see the pharmaceutical advertising. I mean, they're kind of, it's almost one of an ilk, you know. Um, I mean, we are an outlier, quite frankly, and I think we could learn a lot from the way other countries are doing things um, in, in this regard. I mean, I wouldn't go as far as, as Scandinavia or Norway where, you know, in Norway, there's no such thing as an individual candidate. Each, each party comes up with a party list that they establish, and then depending on how many votes the party gets, that's how many people get seats. I mean, that's, that's probably going too far, but you know, whatever party structure we had in the old days, the old smoke-filled rooms and the, you know, the strong committees, the Strom Thurmonds and the Richard Russells, that's long gone. Uh, it's very entrepreneurial. Even here in Minnesota, Mark Dayton came in waltzing in from the outside, right? Um, so how do you, how, I don't know, I just, I, as an individual citizen, I would, I would really focus in on some of those structural things and demand that our politicians, but you're, you're up against a wall of money, a wall of money. You know, that, um, Samuel Huntington in his last book, okay, he, he's well known for, um, for uh, uh, the clash of civilizations, but his last book was called Who Are We? And um, in it, it was a controversial book because he questioned immigration. He's a conservative. But he said the main issue going forward, the main problem will be what he called Davos man. The fact that a global economic elite has emerged that goes to the same schools, that, that, in other words, that it's deracinated, that transcends borders, and that, that frankly, is setting the, stage, setting the course under globalization. Um, it, it may be a little polemical, but to have a, a conservative like Huntington argue that, and there's a fellow named Nils Gilman, I'll, just one more point on this, uh, also at Berkeley, uh, who has written a book called The Twin Insurgency. And he says there are insurgents in the world today against, against the system, against, against nation states. You've got a global elite that is trying to uh, s sort of um, secede from society in terms of paying taxes. They don't want to pay taxes. Uh, they're creating what he calls micro-sovereignties. Uh, I mean, a gated community would be an example, but they are healthcare. Uh, you know, executive examinations at Mayo, you know, with money, you can basically create what he calls micro-sovereignties. And he says at the other end, it's global crime, global mafias creating micro-sovereignties. Parts of Mexico today are run by, by gangs. So he said these two are weakening the nation state and neither group wants to take over the nation state. The last thing they want to do is govern it. They just don't want to be bothered. But the, but the effect is to weaken the polity for all. You know? um, once again, these, these ideas are out there, and, and this gets back to the inequality issue of the effects of globalization over the past 40 years. Um, how the average citizen gets at that, I think the first place to go after it is money and politics. Okay, great, I have a question right here in front. If I may, back to China again. Yep. Um, after World War II, China was just about out of it, and certainly by the time my, my, Mao died, there was almost nothing left of China. Yep. And then you talk about the cyclical nature of the Chinese uh, idea of their cyclical nature. How afraid of the West, and maybe America in particular, do you think the Chinese might be in their motivation for acting the way that they are? They are, um, they are they're increasingly worried since 2008, since our economic crisis because they've been fairly, it's, it's kind of uncanny, but they are a, a, a power that's rising within the structures we created. They're not challenging, it's not like Japan or China before World War II. They're rising inside. Um, and they frankly don't want those structures to change. They're actually, uh, when, when we pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership and Paris Climate 
uh, agreement, uh, Xi Jinping at Davos at the World Economic Forum said, we're still here, we're, we're gonna work with you on world trade, we're gonna you know, strengthen the structures, all that sort of thing. Um, so uh, they feel that, they feel that they need, you know, I, talk, I talked about a cocoon after World War II, and really the 19th century we did that too, we protected our economy. The Chinese want stability over the next decades to fully emerge. They are not ready for conflict, um, and therefore they're highly motivated to try to keep things on track. And they're afraid that we now are losing confidence over here and beginning to seek scapegoats, i.e. them. Um, and um, uh, they're, they're just worried that as our politics get more and more unhinged, um, that that they could be that they could be the ones to 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 bear the brunt. Um, it's true that that there should be some changes in the way that they that they subsidize um, exports in intellectual property. There's all kinds of things where yeah you could you really should have some change. Um, um, it's you know one thing when I talked about how this administration wants to force China out of the global economy. The new NAFTA with Canada has a very interesting provision that nobody paid attention to until after it was signed. Article 32, Section 10 says, any signatory to the new NAFTA that signs a trade agreement with a non-market economy is out of the agreement. Well, of course, that's China. And the Canadian press has been writing about this. Does this mean, did, China, did Canada just give up its right to strike a trade deal with China? Um, because, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, if, if that's the case, it's, it's not it's just a free trade agreement. Um, you know, it, it becomes more than that. It, it becomes almost like a customs union. Um, so, um, yeah, they're worried. They're, they're worried about all those things. So, but, and they're getting closer to Russia. They are, you know, they're starting to, to counteract what we're doing. Any okay, I'm going to questions? take one last question. Before we do that, though, I just want to remind you about our headliners next month. It's on April 4th. Um, it's going to be a great topic. Here's the title. Believe me, seeking truth in an age of disinformation. I can just imagine. Oh. Going to, you, you, you might want to oh. come back. You might want to come back. Uh, presented by the director of the Silha Center for the Study of Media Ethics and Law, Professor Jane Kirtley. So we hope you can make it on April 4th. So with that... One last question over here. Uh, you, you started out with uh, some slides about demography and, and the growth in the population. Could you comment on the impact of the aging of different societies across the world? You know, China with the one-child pi policy has two parents and one child. Yes. Kind of, and the, the parents aren't going to be able to work much longer. Yeah, that's going to be In the U.S., we have kind of the intergenerational challenges. Right, it's, that's gonna be a big issue for China. Um, you know, Japan shows that you can age and kind of go along, I mean, you know, with low growth. I mean, a lot of people are looking at them as a, as a low growth uh, poster child or something, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, the lowest birth rates in the world last year, dead last was Germany. Second lowest, Japan. Those are the third and fourth largest economies in the world. Now, what economists are saying is that that demographic reality means that no matter what we do, global growth is going to slow because the populations in the countries that have money, that have resources, will be declining. And these burgeoning new, you know, the highest birth rate in the world right now is in Niger, I think, eight, seven or eight per woman. Uh, the reason this is happening is because of the success of UN health programs in the last 20 years. People are living longer in addition to the high birth rates. That's why you got this explosive growth. So um, uh, the demographic issue will be really big and uh, you know, it's gonna put all kinds of stress on the environment as well. Uh, and in addition to which, um, you know, the whole push-pull factor on immigration, um, you're gonna have, especially uh, coming out of Africa, uh, people trying to, trying to leave for a better life. So th these pressures are not gonna go away. Um, the UN is very close to establishing a new status of a refugee, climate refugees. That, that that will be a new category. The West is opposing that. So no, demographics will be huge. I, you know, given next week's subject, I ask the person about deep fake. Deep fake. This is the new technology now that, it, that allows states and, and individuals to create streaming video that cannot be detected as false. 
Now, this is uh, DARPA, the Defense Research Agency, has made this her number one priority because what if, I mean, you could have a, a video of Putin declaring war or God knows what, um, and if our intelligence agencies can't detect that it's false, it, it becomes a, a, a hall of mirrors. So deep fake is the new kid on the block, and be sure to ask them about that. Okay, yes. You, you so can come and ask that question. So thanks, Tom, very much. Fascinating conversation.